But what follows is actually a class. It turns out that I had the privilege of teaching the first class of medical school to the class of 2018 on Monday morning. And I promised them it was a two-part class. This is part two. Now, for those who missed the first class, which is the rest of us, let me tell you what we covered. Every year, when medical students come to OUWB, we ask them to ask of themselves two questions. So those who were here last year will remember the two questions. And those are, what do I want to do? And who do I want to be? On Monday, we talked about, what do I want to do? The techniques about how one masters the acquisition of knowledge for the parents and significant others and spouses in the room, students tell us it's a fire hydrant of information. I'm sipping it through a straw. The last question is, who do I want to be is a bit different. And that's what the subject is today, because this is the beginning of the study of medicine in another dimension. You know, back in 2017, the American Medical Association, and we have a representative of the president of the Michigan State Medical Society here, our chair of anesthesiology, Dr. Jim Grant, on the first row. So the AMA said the following. They were concerned, and I'll quote from it, that the emphasis on medical students acquiring knowledge and problem solving may lead to physicians to perceive that patients are simply sources of data and problems to be solved instead of individuals in need. And in the words of a Beaumont physician who is here today, he's come to every white coat ceremony, Dr. David Forst, I know you can train a doctor to be academically excellent. My challenge to you, how do you train a physician to be kind? Now many students, including every member of the class of 2018, because I got a chance to meet them on Monday morning and through the halls during the week, told us that they're coming to medical school with an elevated level of enthusiasm. Some will even tell you, you know, I hope to use medicine as a tool to change the world. So with this, I'd like to go back to how you change the world. We had an honors convocation this past spring, and actually next year there will be a new tradition, and the honors convocation will always occur the day before graduation. That will be the new tradition for us. And our speaker for honors convocation was my esteemed colleague at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, uh, Dr. Chip, Dean Chip Chova. And he taught us the following. He said, in order to lead, and he is probably the expert in the scholarship of leadership in medicine. He says, in order to lead, leadership begins with leading oneself. You can't lead other people unless you have changed yourself in order to lead. At OUWB, we kind of approach it in a different way, and we look at the power of yourself in the dimensions other than the knowledge you acquire and the technical skills you master. And I'm going to go back to a story that comes from a student of character development from the 19th century. His name was Israel Salanter. And I'm going to translate it and make it contemporary for a 21st century audience. And this is the way it goes. I really thought I could change the world, but I couldn't. So I worked on changing my country and really fell short. So then I worked on my town, my community, and didn't make much of a dent. I tried my family, came up short there too. And it was then that I realized that the only person I can really change is myself. But when I changed myself, I changed my family, and the ripple effect goes on. It's part of the curriculum that we have here at OUWB. It's interspersed throughout the curriculum, and I'll come back and cite an observation that was published just last week in the Detroit News from a leader in medical education in the United States who had something to say about our approach. It's not just a course. There is a PRISM course, but there's more to it. Last year, I challenged the class of 2017 and the entire medical school to focus on the personal attribute of expressing gratitude. And the reason we chose that is it is very, very hard to say thank you at the same time you're being arrogant. <laughs> so that gratitude, saying thank you, is a way of 
almost immunizing oneself against an attribute that can be detrimental to the practice of medicine. And we talked last year about the fact that if you get used to saying thank you to the cleaning crew at night who is preparing O'Dowd Hall and making it fresh for the next morning, and you used to saying thank you to your teachers and the people who are in the staff, it'll come as you as second nature to thank a nurse when you're at Beaumont. And when you do that, that builds teamwork and you'll have friends for life in the medical staff. In fact, our assistant dean, Dr. Sandy LeBlanc, started an interesting tradition in the School of Medicine. We have a gratitude jar. There are scraps of paper in the Center for Medical Student Services, just as you come in, off to the side in the reception area, and you can write on a piece of paper, I am grateful for. Put it in the jar anonymously. And we invite people, when they come to the center, to just pull out a piece of paper and see how other folks are doing. So I'm recommending that we continue that emphasis on saying thank you as an antidote for against arrogance and add another attribute to it, and that's generosity. So you're going to say, oh my gosh, I'm just starting medical school. He's hitting me up for donations already. <laughs> we will when you're alumni. <laughs> it's guaranteed. But I'm going to define generosity in another dimension. I'm going to start by asking medical students, because this is really hard. You know, white coat ceremony is a natural high. And within six weeks, I'm going to be back inside the class just <laughs> trying to pull you back up again. All right, it just gets really hard. See if you can cultivate a generous spirit so that even in the roughest day, when you come home to a roommate, a spouse, a significant other, you get a phone call from your college roommate you have enough energy left to be generous enough to listen to how their day went, see how they're doing. Now let's go beyond that. You know, we have Compass, a center for community engagement, and you can volunteer, or maybe take on an extra activity. Okay, that's two. But I'd like to define generosity in another dimension, and that is giving other people the benefit of the doubt. See, that has a lot to do for building community. And there's an insert in your program that has the patch that our medical students have. And you'll notice that the emblem for the medical school are two concentric circles, an outer circle of gold representing Oakland University and an inner circle of burgundy representing Beaumont. We talked on Monday about the fact that those are symbols for a community. Everyone in a community is a point on that circle. And if but one point drops off, you don't have a community anymore. Now, that's part of our approach to diversity and inclusion, but it's part of our purpose in building you up and having you practice these skills on the way to becoming a physician. Let me give you an example of this. We lost a very beloved member of our founding team, Dr. Michelle Rabel. She came up from Chicago and she was one of the people who contributed heavily to the development of the curriculum that you're going to experience. And two days after we received preliminary accreditation, Michelle, who was a hematologist, received a diagnosis of leukemia. And sadly, we lost Michelle four months later. She would have loved to have been here to meet you. I'm going to take you back to what happened before Michelle came here and show you the power of a community. So Michelle, turns out, was my vice chair when I was chair of pathology at University of Illinois in Chicago. Michelle was vice chair for education. And there was a task that she had to accomplish. It was very complex. She had to merge two residency programs into one. And what happened in that year is that the residents didn't know from month to month where they would be the next month. Would they be in this rotation, that rotation? It was on the fly. And the residents became very, very upset because they couldn't make plans for vacation. They couldn't make plans for, all right. So it's a little bit before social networking, and what happens goes on to email. And it goes something like this. I guess Dr. Rabel doesn't care about us anymore. I suppose Dr. Rabel's too engaged in her master's program to pay attention to us, and so on and so forth, until someone hit a reply button and included her in the thread. Now, Michelle had flaming red hair, for those who remember her, and her picture is still on our website in the administration section. And she came into my office. Her face was the color of her hair. And I've never seen this combination of emotions. It was fury and, and, and sadness. She had tears streaming down her face. And she'd say, how could they think that of me? 
so the next day, we were scheduled to have chairman's rounds for the residents. So for those who aren't in the practice of medicine, chairs of departments will frequently meet with the residents once a month and they review difficult cases and challenging concepts. I canceled the difficult cases and we read a journal article out loud, paragraph by paragraph, except it wasn't from the medical literature. It was from a book called The Other Side of the Story. And I'll paraphrase it for you. And Mr. Michelsi is gonna remember this because we told this story at the night of my interview here. And here's the story. So a man, father of the bride, is preparing for his daughter's wedding and he needs to hire a photographer. So he asked for a recommendation. Who do you recommend? I have a name in mind. Oh, I wouldn't hire him. Why wouldn't you hire him, his friend said. Because the last wedding he worked, he came in halfway through. Did you ever hear something like this? Halfway through the wedding, a photographer should show up? And he said, you know what? I know that you're a very principled person, so go ahead and ask the person who did the music at the event. And he'll tell you, he did, he asked. Dejected, couldn't make the recommendation. He ran into the photographer a short time after that and said, you know, I recommended you for a job. Be a photographer at a wedding. And they told me the last wedding you worked, you came in halfway through. He said, yeah, let me tell you about that. The photographer they hired didn't show up, and I got a call, so I got there as fast as I could. Why did you ask? The room of my residence went very, very quiet. People thought for a minute, and one hand shot up and said, is that about Dr. Rabel? And one of the things that we talked about is whenever you hear something and you can come to a conclusion that is adverse, that puts somebody in a bad light, can you automatically kick in a program that can come up with three to five alternative explanations? Somebody didn't return my email. Mm, maybe they didn't get it. Maybe it didn't send. Maybe it ended up in a spam filter. Or maybe they weren't vacant. Come up with three or five. I'm going to give you some other examples, and we're going to get it right down to the practice of medicine. But before I do that, there was a dinner meeting when I was being interviewed here, and that was the night that Dr. Forst asked the question, how do you train a physician to be kind? And I actually related that story. On the way back to the hotel, Mr. Machowski drove me back to the hotel, and he says, we have a very similar training story at Beaumont. Let me share it with you. So Jim, I'm going to share it with them. The story that Beaumont used in the day was a subway car in Manhattan, in New York. And there is a man standing on in a packed car holding on to a railing, if I recall this correctly, Jim. And there are several children running up and down the car screaming. And they seem to be gravitating back to this man who's standing there very stoically holding on to the pole. So finally, one of the passengers, seeing these children out of control, assumes that the person handing on to the pole is the father, goes over to him and says, sir, are these your children? He said, yeah, can't you keep them under control? To which the man said, I wish I could, they just lost their mother. That not only speaks to giving people the benefit of the doubt, I was really convinced after hearing Dr. Ford's question and Mr. Michalski relate that story to me that Beaumont would be a great place to be a partnership because they would value the humanistic approaches to medicine in addition to the scientific skill and the technical expertise. Sometimes you will hear people be described in unflattering ways. One of the things that permeates medicine is she's brilliant but she's hard to get along with. Hmm. Did you ever work with her? Let me give you another example. I can recall working in an institution in Washington, D.C. at the time. It's called the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And our competition was at Johns Hopkins up the road in Baltimore. And there was a time when I was invited, representing my institution, to go down and teach in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Now, the easiest way to actually to get from Baltimore and Washington down to Chapel Hill is to take the train. It's not to drive or to fly. So I get on the train, and two of my colleagues from Johns Hopkins are on the train, and they won't say hello to me. They're in the car. It's reserved. I know who they are. They're not going to, they didn't talk to me for two days. On the way home, they said to me, you know, we're in competition with you all, and we were just told that you're, like, really aggressive, and, you know, you're just really hard to get... <laughs> He said, but we worked here for two days, and we'd like to keep working with you. And that evolved into two lifelong friendships. Now, I use myself as an example because I want to introduce you to a couple of other concepts. As students, you may hear a rumor, oh, a faculty member who's scheduled for Tuesday morning at 
9, he's supposed to be really boring. Hmm. Could you give him the benefit of the doubt? Try it out for yourself. See how it goes. Suppose we flipped it. And suppose among the faculty, and I assure you, we put a stop to this. We really have a very strict culture. But suppose faculty members actually would say, oh, Anita. We don't have an Anita in this class. I had to think hard. <laughs> Anita whines all the time. Just don't pay any attention to her. Could you imagine what happened if that got around a faculty and the second that Anita comes to you on a clerkship or to ask you for help after class, what are you going to think first about her? Can you come up with five or six other explanations? Maybe Anita's really passionate about what happens, and if you can challenge her passion in the correct direction, that would really come. Huh? What about patience? Suppose it's a handoff on a weekend. You're going away for the weekend. You're discussing with the rest of the team coverage of one of your patients who's ill. She may call over the weekend. And you started off by saying, oh my gosh, this is a patient who just doesn't take his medicines and he's non-compliant and no matter what we do, he can't bring his blood pressure down because he won't take his meds. Can you think of three to five reasons why he may not be taking his meds? Maybe, elderly, he's a sole caretaker for his wife, someone maybe whom he met as a teenager, they've been married for 50 years or so. This is a deeply personal story, by the way. And maybe his wife is beginning to descend into Alzheimer's. And he's so overwhelmed with taking care of himself and her, he just can't think to take his medicines every day. Maybe he's taking so many medicines at different schedules, he can't possibly keep it all together. It's something we call in medicine polypharmacy. How many other explanations can you come up with so that when that patient does call or the patient comes back to clinic, you're not thinking the worst of them, you're giving them a chance. Now, I have one other thing I wanna share with you. I was walking through Beaumont and I still practice medicine at Beaumont so I'm gonna see medical students in the hall all the time. And two of our finest M2s, second year medical students from last year emerged from the library. And they are very, very depressed. You can, I know them. We actually get to know you fairly well. And let's call them um, Alice. I don't think we have an Alice in the school. And Francis. I don't think we have a Francis in the school. And they're best friends. And what makes it so neat is they come from two totally different cultural backgrounds. And they bonded. It's one of the kind of neat things about OUWB and its diversity. So I, I asked a question to Alice. I said, uh, gee, you really, you, you've looked a lot happier to me. And she said, Dean Fulberg, I am so worried about step one. So for those who don't get the lingo, that's the first part of the licensing examination. I'm, and I, I just know I can't do it. I know academically the student can do it. So instead of counseling her, I said the following. I said, Alice, <laughs> you just said you can't do it. Would you ever turn to your friend Francis and say, hey, Francis, I'm convinced you can't pass that one? She was horrified. I said, I would never have that conversation. So why are you having that conversation with yourself? Can you give yourself the benefit of the doubt as you go through? Because all of this is important to being the type of physicians that we really want you to be from this medical school. Because again, it's not just what you do, it's who you are. This came into great focus when a couple of weeks ago, US News and World Report declared that Beaumont Hospital, Royal Oak, was the number one rated hospital in Michigan. We talked about that. And in the press release that accompanied that, that came from Beaumont, Dr. Wood, our chief medical officer wrote the following. He said, through the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine, we are training new doctors in the science of high quality medicine delivered with compassion, the hallmarks of a top ranked hospital. So that came from within and we were very grateful to you David for that observation. Last week, July 29th, the Detroit News ran an article about OUWB. They quoted from medical students and administration, and they also quoted from Dr. Carol Ashenbrenner, 
who is retiring now. She is the Chief Medical Education Officer of the Association of American Medical Colleges. That's the umbrella organization of all allopathic medical schools, MD degree-granting degree medical schools in the United States. And Dr. Aschenbrenner said the following. She said that um, the school's approach to training doctors goes beyond developing a, um, uh, just courses. Here's the quote. A lot of schools have something similar to their curriculum, referring to us, to help physicians as people, but nothing to the degree that OUWB has. That was awesome, coming from the chief education officer of the AAMC. And she continued, and she said, any school that is new has the greatest opportunity to innovate when a new medical schools were announced, our hope was that they would depart from the traditional ways and give us something different, and OUWB is doing that. So when we gathered on Monday, we spoke of that patch, and there is a replica of that in the inset to your program, two circles. The white coat that you have just received and put on is a symbol to the public that you're a physician. And to be honest with you, not every physician wears a white coat. Psychiatrists, pediatricians, many family medicine doctors don't wear white coats. But nevertheless, that's how the public perceives you. If you want to get really special about it, you can call the white coat a vestment. The public associates that with the profession of healing. Your white coat is special in another dimension because it has an OUWB patch that represents the fact that we are two communities. We are a community, a diverse and inclusive and caring community that has assembled to care for its community. That's the symbolism of the two circles. You've accepted the white coat, and you've accepted the white coat with a patch. So you're assuming the responsibility of becoming a physician and I would now ask the class of 2018 to rise and affirm that commitment out loud. And because you're a community and you're going to be studying medicine with physicians, you're learning it for the first time and other physicians continuing to renew their study of medicine, I will please ask all physicians in the room to rise and recite this oath along with you. Let me read this line by line, I align, then you're repeating after me. At the time of being admitted as a member of the medical profession, I solemnly pledge to consecrate my life to the service of humanity. I will give to my teachers the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity. The health of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the secrets that are confided in me even after the patient has died. I will maintain by all the means in my power the honor and the noble traditions of the medical profession. My colleagues will be my sisters and brothers. I will not permit consideration of age, disease or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing, or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights, civil liberties, even under threat. I 
I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. I ask the class of 2018 to remain standing, everyone else to be seated, and I ask everyone in the room to join me in congratulating the class of 2018 as they start the Southern Medicine.